What's up everybody, it's Charles. It has been about six months since I picked up this 2019 Ginster Yellow, one of 13 in the United States Golf R. And it really didn't stay super stock for long. We've actually done a handful of modifications to this car. And in this video, I wanna talk about what I think are the five best first modifications that you can make to this generation of car. Now, most of these modifications are gonna be about the same for the Golf, the GTI, the Alltrack, and the Golf R. Some of the part numbers may be a little bit different, but I think that these five or six things really bring out the best in these vehicles without going overboard and truly feeling like you drive a modified car. I've also done individual videos on a lot of this stuff, and I'll be sure to link that playlist if you guys wanna check that out. Even though this list is really not in any particular order, I think the first thing that we're gonna talk about really should be very early on in your modifications, and that's adding a spare tire kit. The Golf R does not come with a spare tire in the United States. Actually, it's super common today that a car doesn't come with a spare tire, which I think is absolutely insane. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people that wouldn't change their tire anyway, and you can get a service like AAA. All good, all cool. However, for me, it is just one less thing to worry about. I did the full kit, which includes the spare tire, the jack, the lug wrench, the foam insert, to house all the tools, and then one piece of trim that allows the spare tire to fit all the way down. You can modify your factory trim on the Golf R to make it fit, but it looks a little bit nicer when we just use the right trim, and it really wasn't that much more expensive. The good thing is, is it'll fit over the brakes in the front, it'll fit over the brakes in the rear, and your subwoofer, if you have the Fender Audio, which in a Golf R you would, you can still drop the subwoofer inside of that tire. It's all factory stuff, so it fits perfectly. Next up on that list is going to be an ECM tune. Now, it doesn't matter if it's a Golf R, GTI, Alltrack, whatever. Doing the ECM tune really brings the car alive. I, I feel like with stage one, especially Golf R and GTI, that's how it should have came from the factory. It improves just about every aspect of being behind the wheel of the car. And that's whether you have a DSG or whether you have a manual transmission. If you have a manual transmission, you get to save a little bit of money. Uh, the high torque files on most tuning companies, ECM software does require that you do a DC, uh, DSG tune. So that's something that plays into the cost of doing this modification, but it brings the entire car live. Faster shifts, better throttle response, overall more boost. It just makes the car feel so much more fun to drive. Now, there is a couple of questions that always come up whenever I talk about ECM tunes. Who makes the best tune and will it void my warranty? From a who makes the best tune standpoint, there's about five major players in the VW Audi tuning world that to me, you're probably gonna be happy with no matter which one you pick. I have integrated engineering software on my car and it's fantastic. I think for most people, if you choose IE like I have, if you go APR, if you go Unitronic, if you go from Reflect Tuning, if you go to Cobb, if you go to United Motorsports, you're gonna be pretty happy with whatever tune that you go with, sticking with one of the major players. It also kind of depends on which piece of equipment we're trying to tune. When it comes to something like the Haldex, the all-wheel drive system, most of those tuning companies don't have a Haldex tune. In fact, before too long, maybe even at Wookiees in the Woods, I'll probably be doing a Haldex tune from United Motorsports on my Golf R. I have their tune, uh, ECM tune, Haldex tune on the R32, and it's pretty good. Uh, but the tuning capability of these cars versus the older stuff, night and day difference. Next up, will it void my warranty? Well, that is not a black and white yes or no answer to a great question. Will it flat out void every bit of warranty on your car? The answer to that in 99% of cases is no. It will not blanket void everything. If you tune your ECM software and you have a headlight go out, uh, like an HID or something that would normally be covered under warranty, it should still be covered under warranty. However, there always is the possibility that if you have some type of engine related failure, whether it's a sensor, whether it's a component, or something like that, a tune could impact whether something is covered or not. So you really, before you make the jump to stage one or any ECM software tune, whether it's t transmission, Haldex, or actual engine computer, um, you need to be prepared that a failure may not be covered under warranty, whether it's something expensive, like a turbocharger, or whether it's something simple, like a fan going out. I have seen both of those things 
get declined on a car that was tuned, and uh, both of those things get approved on a car that was tuned. It's really case by case. Now, a piece of advice, if you are tuned and you do have an issue, the whole goal for you as a customer is to want them to help you, not to feel like they have to. You want them on your side. You want them to be your advocate. So be nice, be polite, be professional. And uh, if you're going in there, guns a-blazing, screaming and yelling, you're probably not as likely to get that extra bit of help from the dealership as if you were being cool about it and understanding. And, uh, you know, it's not their policy. They don't make up the rules. They're just trying to do their best to follow them. But I don't think that you're going to get a better bang for buck in overall driving experience improvement as you will with a stage one tune. Now, number three does not give you any improvement in driving, unlike the ECM tune, but what it does give you is an incredible peace of mind. And that's doing one of two things, and I'm cool with both of these. Installing an all-track belly pan or some other type of reinforced belly pan. If you drive an all-track, you don't need to do this. Or doing a metal pan upgrade. Either one of these is cool. I like the all-track pan because it's OE, and you guys know me, I'm kind of snobby about that kind of stuff but there are other solutions as well. And there are also metal oil pans that you can install to cover up the composite oil pan that these cars have. This is an oil pan that all the Mark 7s have, and the Alltrack is the only one that has a pan that covers it up in any kind of way. That's a pretty legit pan, reinforced and whatnot, but none of the rest of them have it. They all have a pan that stops right really at where the oil pan is. And while I'm not taking the golf bar off road or anything like that, you never know what can pop up and hit that oil pan and cause damage. So it unfortunately does not give you any cool guy points or any scene points or pops and bangs or you know 200 horsepower, but it may, it may help prevent having a catastrophic oil loss resulting in catastrophic engine failure. Number four is a rear sway bar upgrade. I am convinced that now, going forward on every car that I own that is not rear wheel drive, like the Miata, it will get a rear sway bar upgrade. It is that good of an upgrade. The best part, it's about 250 to 300 bucks, depending on if you get end links or not, that'll add, well, quite a bit on this one because we went with the high test end links. You just get regular metal, uh, replacement end links, then it's going to save you quite a bit of money. The end links on these cars are composite or plastic, so it's good to get those out, get some metal ones on there. But, you know, I, I touted the benefit of the software tune as being the best overall upgrade in overall vehicle performance, and I still, I, I believe that, I really, really do. However, when it comes to handling, and in like spirited driving, twisties in the mountains, or autocross or whatever, the rear sway bar is such an amazing upgrade reducing that understeer, giving you a little bit more control, being able to drive with the throttle and having it give you more of a result than without it is such a huge benefit. If you've never driven a car like this, if you own one of these and you've never driven a car with a rear sway bar upgrade, find someone with one and drive it. Or honestly, just pull the trigger and buy it because I think you're going to be happy with it. Typically, they're pretty easy DIY. Typically, they're not very expensive, especially when talking about suspension upgrades and components. For me, the best part of having that rear sway bar upgrade is that when you're in that spirited driving situation, autocross, twisty mountain roads, you really feel it. It's active. You, you know you've made an upgrade. The flip side is when you're cruising to work in the morning at you know 6.30 in the morning and you're half asleep, there is no difference in the way the car behaves. You don't have to be worried when you have to take a coworker somewhere and your car rides so stiff that the fillings in their teeth are rattling out or your car has basically no shock absorption. It's just bouncing down the road. It doesn't change any of that at all. It's only when you're in sort of that performance driving, spirited driving situation that it makes an improvement. It's one of the very few things that you get an improvement with really no downside, other than, well, you have to spend the money to put it on. So number five is going to be a collection of things, but they're all going to be centered around coding and adaptation changes. This is my VCDS cable. Doesn't matter whether you're using VCDS or OBD11. I'm a VCDS user, but I know a lot of you guys are OBD11 users, and that's perfectly fine with me too. This car and these Mark 7s, seven, seven and a half, can do so many more things than they are programmed to do in the United States from the factory. Really cool things like rolling the windows up and down with the remote, coding so that the power fold mirrors actually power fold when you lock and unlock the car, doing things like turning the sound actor all the way down, which is the very first thing I ever did on this car, so we didn't get those fake engine noises pumped in, 
There is almost an unlimited amount of things you can do with software adaptation and coding changes. So here's a couple that I've done. Turn the sound actor all the way down. Coded the power fold mirrors, which the power fold mirrors are an add-on and an awesome one at that. Added and then coded our touch handles for the rear doors. One of my favorite coatings that I've changed is when I put it in reverse, you used to have to hit the button for the little overlay of the car to pop up and show you like where objects were around the car. With a simple coding change, it pops up automatically so I don't have to hit yet another button. I know that seems silly and I know that seems lazy, but it's one of those niceties that the car has the capability to do so why not go ahead and have it done? Now, a couple of the next coding changes I have planned are windows up and down with the remote. I don't take the key out of my pocket ever, so it's not something that I was really like jumping at the bit to do. The other one I have planned is coding start stop off. I've tried a couple of different things. You can just unplug the battery maintenance module and the car won't shut off, but you get warnings in the dash. Changing the voltage gives you warnings in the dash. So I'm trying to find a good way to stop the start stop system without having warnings pop up in the dash. And it's plays into so many modules, so uh, it's proving a little bit more challenging than I expected, but the, the thing didn't bother me at first, but as I've driven the car and owned it longer, it's kind of driving me nuts. I find it very distracting. I find it distracting when other cars do it as well, so that one will be coded up. But all those things and more are things that you can do by changing coding or adaptations, all done with VCDS or OBD11. And a quick warning, always be careful when you change stuff. Make sure you document what you changed it from, what you changed it to. That way, if you have to go back and put it back, uh, it's not going to be that big of a problem. And only change one thing at a time and make sure it doesn't impact anything else. All right, a handful of honorable mentions that I'm going to burn through super duper quick. Window tint and paint protection. This car is coated in Expel. It makes washing the car insanely easy. I absolutely love it. There's a couple of little nicks that I've gotten on the front bumper. And uh, I'm going to do a video on that for you guys. So I haven't fixed them yet. But little heat and they'll self-heal. It's really, really cool. Also, window tint. I have ceramic window tint on this car. I'm a huge window tint guy. I like the privacy. I like how much cooler the inside of the car is with the window tint versus without. So big fan of both of those. My whole car is covered. If you don't do the whole car in some kind of paint protection film like Expel, uh, consider just doing maybe the front and then the B pillar appliques or anywhere you have piano black. That piano black around the car gets scratched up so, so easy. And putting a layer of protection on it will help preserve that so that it looks good, uh, well, like six months from now, <laughs> because that stuff does, like, you can't even look at it without it feeling like it's getting scratched. Next up, power fold mirrors. Not necessary in the United States, but a very cool factor type thing. Also, they have puddle lights in them, which I really like how it illuminates the door. We got the P3 gauge in there, so if you want a boost gauge or something like that, or it does way more than boost, it's a pretty cool little upgrade, and it looks sort of factory-ish because it sits right in the vent. Now, for this one, I've gone back and forth and changed it a few times, but you can actually have where your 12-volt outlets will work on 30 power rather than just 15 power. So the way the 12-volt outlets work in this car is you have to have the key on in order for them to do anything. Keys off, nothing's powered. You can move this fuse down one location, and it will change that to now being 30 powered, not 15 powered. What I like about that is I can leave my GoPro in the back underneath all the stuff in the trunk and it can charge it for me rather than having to leave the key on or something like that or bring a little jump pack to keep the GoPro charged. Now you do have to be careful. The car should be smart enough and cut power if the battery voltage is too low to power up whatever you have plugged in. But personally, I'm not gonna rely on that. Uh, I have a jump pack in the car anyway, so it wouldn't be a problem and I recommend that you do as well but it's something you do want to consider. This is probably why it's 15 powered, which means ignition on power rather than 30 power from the factory. Also, if you guys want a step-by-step -step video on how to do that, let me know and I'll make a really short, easy to follow video for that. One more honorable mention, if you buy this car used, tires, put new tires on it, high performance tires, some performance summer tires, whatever fits the driving situation you're in, that'll make such a huge difference in the car. It's not cheap to get good tires, but it is almost always worth it in every case. So a couple of things I'm working on coming up mods for this car. Suspension, I didn't add it to this list. To do it what I feel is right, which is to retain dynamic chassis control, uh, like with coilovers or something, can be very, very expensive, two to $3,000. So I don't think that makes a list of first mods. I think the suspension is fine, not perfect, but fine from the factory. That's gonna be coming down the road. We're gonna be working on seeing if we can add a power lift gate like the Atlas has. I'm looking to add remote start, factory remote start, which I'm told can't be done, but we'll see if we can prove the powers that be wrong, or maybe we'll prove the powers that be right. Wheel and tire upgrade, of course. Uh, big brake kit is another one that a lot of people do. Personally, I think the brakes 
on the stock Golf R are fantastic. I think they're really, really good. Uh, they produce a lot of dust, but I think overall they stop wonderfully. Now, in a track situation, that may be a little different, but for street driving, they're really, really good. All right, so there's my top five or six or so first upgrades for the Mark 7 platform Golf R GTI, all track unless you're doing the belly pan and golf. What do you guys think? What did I miss? What else is on that list of very first modifications you should make to your Mark 7? All right, so with that, I'm out. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll talk to you again next time.